Aloha everyone, mahalo for attending the first of five Rainbow Town Hall panels. My name is Randy Soriano and I am the board member at the Hawaii LGBT Legacy Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization that proudly brings new Honolulu pride every year. The Rainbow Town Hall panel series is a project that was led by a team of passionate volunteers, including myself and fellow board member, Andrew Ogata. Our goal is to start an open conversation that brings focus to topics that affect our LGBTQIA community. We're immensely grateful to have leaders, advocates, and community members serve as panelists who are able to articulate their expertise and personal experiences on these issues and hopefully spark community awareness that will affect positive change for the future. Our program today will end around 6 p.m. and there will be a Q&A session during the last 10 minutes. Feel free to add your question to the Q&A box and our moderator will get to you, get to as many questions as possible at the end of the panel. Also, we're streaming live on Honolulu Pride Facebook page, so feel free to encourage your friends and family to tune in as well. Before we get started, I want to introduce Andrew, who will share with you some information on this year's Honolulu Pride Festival. Festival. Hi, everyone. Um, this year has required us to shift to a virtual Honolulu Pride experience, but we're excited to have you all join our celebration theme, Shaka and Shine. Along with the Rainbow Town Hall panels, Honolulu Pride has partnered with Lay Magazine to produce a special show called Aloha with Pride, Shaka and Shine, which celebrates Hawaii's remarkable LGBTQIA plus history and celebrates our contemporary change makers. It will feature a performance by the new original song, Shaka and Shine by local artist, Kaylana, tune in to our four broadcasts on Thursday, October 15th at 7.30 p.m. on KHON2, Friday, October 16th at 8 p.m. on KHLL, Saturday, October 17th at 6.30 p.m. on KHII, and Sunday, October 18th at 7 p.m. on KHON2. This program will also be live streamed on KHON2.com, KHON's Facebook page, and KHON's YouTube channel. Also, don't miss the Honolulu Pride virtual after party hosted by Candy Shell and my friend George, streaming live Saturday, October 17th at 7 p.m. at honolulupride.com. The show will feature content created by Hawaii's LGBTQIA plus Ohana and our allies, performances by local artists, special videos from our sponsors, and our very first tiny float parade. If you're in Waikiki, don't forget to check out Rainbows Over Waikiki, our annual beautification and awareness project with more than 120 pride banners lining Ala Moana and Kalakaua. Don't forget to tag your photos with hashtag Rainbows Over Waikiki, hashtag Honolulu Pride, and hashtag Shaka and Shine. At this time, we want to introduce our esteemed panelists. First, we have Sheena Lonoa Ea Alexander. Sheena is the Smart Justice Organizer at ACLU Hawaii. The Smart Justice Program is an, is an initiative to challenge the racial disparities in the criminal legal system and decarcerate Hawaii. Partnering her experience of being impacted by incarcerated family members and a passion for advocacy, Sheena dreams of a Hawaii without cages. Prior to her work at ACLU, Sheena served on boards committed to queer and trans rights, worked on electoral campaigns and at the state legislature in Hawaii, and occupied Cheyenne social Shoshone and the Arapaho Territory in Wyoming. Um, next, we have Kat Brady. Kat is a community justice advocate and coordinator of Community Alliance on Prisons, or CAP, a community initiative promoting smart justice policies in Hawaii for more than two decades. CAP's work include, includes the conditions of confinement, visitation issues, racial injustice, and human rights concerns. Kat also serves as a prisoner advocate on three UH institutional review boards and works closely with several community organizations on justice issues. Next, Mandy Fernandez is the policy director at the American Civil Liberties Union of Hawaii, where she manages the organization's legislative program. She works closely with the community stakeholders, other nonprofit organizations, elected officials, and government agencies to advance policy change and defend a against attacks on the state and federal constitutions. Mandy serves on the boards of the Hawaii LGBT Legal Association and Hawaii Children's Action Network Speak. She taught a short course on LGBTQ rights at the William S. Richardson School of Law and now lives in Kaka'ako with her wife, their son, and their two cats. Next, Stacia Ohira is a convicted felon who has served all of her time in an 
all male facilities. She has successfully completed all of her requirements of parole and has been arrest free for more than 20 years. More importantly, she has built a tremendous life for herself as well as for her family. She currently works for the state of Hawaii as a staff development trainer. Last but not least, we have our moderator, Kim Koko Iwamoto. Kim Koko is a public interest attorney, small business owner, and community activist. She started her career at Volunteer Legal Services of Hawaii, coordinating three legal clinics across the state. She has served as a licensed therapeutic foster parent to incarcerated queer youth. And as an affordable housing landlord, she welcomes tenants who have been incarcerated in the past. She, is elected to this, she was elected to the State Board of Education in 2006 and re-elected in 2010. She served on the Hawaii Civil Rights Commission from 2012 to 2016. And now Kim Koko serves on the Board of Hawaii Alliance for Progressive Action. On behalf of the Hawaii LGBT Legacy Foundation, mahalo to all of you for participating today. And without further ado, we would like to turn over our panel to moderator Kim Koko Iwamoto. Thank you so much, Andrew and Randy from the Hawaii LGBT Legacy Foundation for hosting and promoting this forum and this opportunity to honor the full diversity of our community um, in this way. Thank you so much. And as we get started, um, our bios contained many different hats that we kind of wear and we bring to this space and this conversation. So if there's any that we left out um, that you'll be maybe referencing or that'll inform your contribution today, um, feel free to, to um, shout them out. So for me, I think highlighted was that, you know, I've been a foster parent, uh, a, land, a landlord to, um, to people who are coming out of prison. Um, and also um, having served on the Board of Education, the school to prison pipeline has always been a concern for me. Um, so those are some of the hats um, that I bring to this um, moderation. Um, but how about for you, Stacia? Um, you have to unmute yourself. I forgot that I muted myself. Nobody puts baby in the corner. But um, anyway, so I have a lot of hats that I wear. So I was a foster parent too for a while, for a long time. And then all of the, my kids that I raised all grew up and they're um, all responsible adults and successfully transitioned into adulthood. Um, I'm also a board member of the ACLU. Um, yeah, I do a lot of things. And so um, I was telling Randy and Andrew yesterday that it's been so long since I spoke on LGBT specific issues because I am too fish for all of that. But I actually, in layman's term, I, I live a pretty normal life now. And, you know, I have a partner. I have my children are all grown up. Some of them have had kids on their own, so I'm a grandparent to them. Um, so participating in this, I call them ABCDEFG because there's so much letters, I don't even know what they are already. ABCDEFG, HIJK, LMNOP um, is pretty exciting because, you know, it brings me back to my roots and it brings me back to where it all began. And I think that to understand my story, and how I ended up incarcerated, um, you kind of have to know the beginning of it too, and the discriminations and the, and the disparities that I face as um, a young child. And even though if I, I, I lived actually a very privileged life growing up, um, how that didn't matter when it came to, to a lot of the things that, I, that were challenges for me that ended me in prison. Thank you. Um, how about you, Shana? How, are there, what hats are you bringing into this conversation? Um, I think just some of like the basic ones. Um, I'm 27, I'm cis, I identify as queer um, and hapa. Um, I am born and raised on Oahu. Um, I'm the oldest of seven siblings. Uh, I'm pretty privileged in that in my family, uh, queerness was pretty normalized because I had I have a, a gay auntie and gay uncle, and um, they are like my Hanai parents. Um, 
but also too, my family has been deeply impacted by incarceration. Uh, my dad was incarcerated for much of my life. A few of my cousins have experienced incarceration and, and my uncles. Um, and I also, I spent a few years away uh, at, in Wyoming uh, organizing, um, but I came home and especially wanted to come home after seeing what would happen um, on Mauna Kea with witnessing Kia'i being arrested. And um, a lot of them were kapuna and in them I saw my dad uh, and then I saw a lot of my, my family. Um, so it was, and seeing them zip tied and being arrested uh, also reminded me so starkly of like what they are, what they, the action that they chose to engage in um, and what they were signing up for, what incarceration looks like, what our prisons and jails look like. Uh, so I guess that, that's sort of the hat I'm wearing. Um, yeah, I'm just glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Mandy. Hi, Aloha. Um, let's see. I am a queer woman. I'm married to a woman, my wife. We have a little baby who just turned one. So we have a little gaby, a little, a little queer family, uh, which is really wonderful. It's been super exciting. I used to have hobbies, but then I had a baby. And, um, you know, I, I had a really privileged upbringing. I, you know, I have, I have white privilege. I have uh, class privilege. And I also have a privilege that Shana spoke to, which is that I did have a supportive environment at home. I, when I came out to my parents, I was in my twenties, but I, um, they were, they were very accepting and they're 100% accepting of my family. And um, I can't imagine how hard it would have been without that. Um, I'm just, I'm really, really grateful for that. I am coming into this space, not just as the policy director of the ACLU of Hawaii, but as someone who deeply, deeply believes that our criminal legal system is broken and has directly and intentionally harmed the LGBTQ community and that we cannot rely on this broken system for healing or liberation. I believe that people are more than the worst thing that they've done. I believe that people, everyone makes mistakes. I have made a lot of mistakes and my mistakes have not been punished through the carceral system. Um, and that is the only difference between me and somebody who has been incarcerated is that our mistakes were punished differently. Thank you, thank you for joining us. Should I just go? Yes, Kat, I'm sorry, I might have <laughs> hit mute before you, I said your name, Kat, please, please, <laughs> welcome. Aloha. So I'm the coordinator of Community Alliance on Prisons, and I've been working on justice issues in Hawaii for 25 years. Before that, I worked on a lot of homeless issues in Haleiwa. They built a homeless village, and I went in and taught adults to read and write, and then after that, I would teach their kids to read. So it was really rewarding and it's all connected to everything. And before that, I was in New York. I've been in Hawaii 35 years. And in New York, I ran the Screen Actors Guild for a long time. So I've had a lot of experience with GL, you know, LBGT issues because that's um, a lot of heartbreak in uh, the theater business <laughs> and in acting. Um, so everything I did in my life actually led me to what I'm doing, because when I was a kid, I always was the smallest kid in my neighborhood fighting for justice for everybody, usually really big people. <laughs> Thank you, Kat. And you've been a tremendous ally um, on all of the issues that we've been um, all fighting for. So thank you so much and leading the charge on um, obviously on justice reform issues in Hawaii. Thank you so much. Um, so why don't we get started with um, discussing what some of the, um, what some of the drivers of incarceration for the LGBTQ communities are? Like how do we as um, a community or coming, representing different communities, how do we intersect with the incarceration or the criminal justice system? And I think um, Mandy had some thoughts and I'm sure Stacia does too. So why don't we hear from Mandy and then Stacia? Great, so in order to look at how the, um, the LGBTQ communities 
interact with the criminal legal system, we have to know a little bit about the history. And, you know, Stonewall was a riot against police violence. And even just within, um, you know, criminal laws, uh, it wasn't so long ago, it was 2003, that Lawrence v. Texas was decided. Um, our, just the way that we love used to be directly criminalized and criminalizing adult consensual sex uh, between two people of the same sex used to be a crime. And, you know, even more recently, there are disparities in how we treat um, uh, sex between between, you know, an 18 year old and a 16 year old. Um, they might be differently treated there up until recently. Um, a lot of states had on the laws differences in the Romeo and, Ju Romeo and Juliet laws. Um, the ACLU actually sued Kansas over Kansas's law that resulted in, um, in a straight teenager getting, you know, 15 months uh, in prison for the same acts that a gay teenager got, you know, 17 years. So that was struck down as unconstitutional as a result of that lawsuit. Some of the drivers of incarceration, some of the conditions that LGBTQ folks face, high rates of entanglement in both the adult criminal legal system and also the juvenile justice system. Um, we know that we face uh, disproportionate rates of homelessness and poverty um, and higher rates of harassment and profiling by police. And I can get a little bit more into detail about the statistics later, but I'd love to hear from Stacia as well. Stacia. Yeah, muted. sorry, I, I keep forgetting that I, I keep muting myself. But um, so anyway, I can speak only towards um, my own personal things and what driv drove me to incarceration. And um, while I just want to make a, a statement that while I'm over all the things that happened to me, you know, and that dr drove me into prison because I'm so, I'm, like I said, I'm so much more than, than all of that. These were some of the issues that drove me to prison. So I was alienated by my, um, by my, not by my entire family, just by the, my parents and my sibling. So I, I used to use that all the time as, as an excuse of, of why I, I, I became like, totally addicted to drugs, why I became totally addicted to relationships, why I became totally addicted to so many things. And that was the thing that drove me um, to prison. Besides the discrimination that I faced in so many different ways, I'll give you a quick example of, I was in a domestic violent relationship for three years and I was getting like totally beat, totally, totally, totally beat. And, um, and so, while I was getting beat, he was wrapping, he wrapped the payphone cord around my neck and like, I couldn't breathe and I was, I thought I was gonna die. And so somebody saved me. And then the police came and then they had the guy arrested. He was in handcuffs and then he started telling them, um, why are you guys arresting me? You know, cause that's some guy, that's some guy, you know? You know, you know, you know her? That's some guy, that's some guy. And so, um, then I couldn't see because he had beat my eyes closed and I couldn't see what was going on. So the person that helped me was telling me, oh my God, they're letting him um, go off his handcuffs. And then they came to me and they arrested me. And they said, you know, you, you want to lie to us? You want to fucking lie to us? And blah, 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 blah. Why you no fight like one fucking man? And, you know, and blah, blah, blah. You're trying to act like he's beating you up and all this kind of stuff. So... That was my last, actually, that was my last um, thing into incarceration. That what, that's what led me to my final round, because I was in and out of prison for a lot of, uh, for many years. And, but this last time, I got put into prison because of that. That's how I got arrested. So, and this, I could go on for hours of all the things what drove me to, but that's kind of like the main things that, that drove me into incarceration. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Um, and also, I mean, Stacia, you could probably um, affirm from what we hear from some of our sisters as well. Um, for a long time, obviously, discrimination in the workplace was legal. Uh, so that kind of pressure to seek uh, financial sustainability in the, in the more illicit um, uh, jobs, um, you know, I mean, if you could get discriminated by getting a job in the in a in the corporate 
field, then, you know, you're pushed to the street kind of, and uh, that could probably um, have an impact on specifically trans women entering the prison system. Um, but also we see the data, and I think Mandy probably has studied this as well, the data around the school to prison pipeline uh, and how we don't even think that this might be true, but it is that even LGBT students are um, punished um, more, more frequently considering um, their representation and for longer periods of time, right? So you layer that with being Hawaiian, you layer that with all these other kind of identities that people may have. And that really has an impact as well, because that's the first time that somebody's identifying who they are within the context of society, right? Is that, what do you think about that? Mandy, do you have more to add about that? I think that's absolutely true. When we talk about not relying on the criminal legal system, we also have to consider all of the funnels that take people into the criminal legal system that we also need to change. And you talked a little bit about, you spoke to school discipline and um, LGBTQ students are uh, disproportionately uh, subject to exclusionary discipline, like suspensions, out of school suspensions um, and for longer. And how are we, it, you know, it's such a, and it's a conventional wisdom, right? We're like, of course, you know, a kid does something wrong, like suspend them. And, and it's so ingrained in, in how we approach uh, problems at school when, a lot of the times like zero po tolerance policies are so much more about schools PR than they are about bringing healing to the victim of an individual incident and bringing rehabilitation to the other student as well. So we can because school is the place to learn and um, we know that that I mean it's 39% of girls in juvenile facilities identify as um, as queer. So this is such a high, that's 40% and 40% of uh, incarcerated women identify as, or are, are either lesbian, bisexual, or are women who sleep with women but don't otherwise identify as lesbian or bisexual, 40%. So we know that our people are being disproportionately locked up and subject to all of the different funnels that lead into incarceration. Can I Does jump anybody in else? here? Yes. <laughs> You know, this is structural. That is the issue. I mean, everything that we're talking about, this is baked into the cake. And that is the problem. That it's like, oh, well, that's just the way it is. Prisons are violent. Stuff happens in there. What do people expect? It's like we expect people to be rehabilitated, to be programmed, and to be treated with dignity and respect, period. I'm off my soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kat. Um, also, you know, in terms of uh, school punishment, uh, one of the things that, well, or even just in, um, criminalizing be the behaviors of minors for spe specifically around school issues. Yes. Um, I know, I know specifically for, for at least one of my foster uh, kids who was picked up at school for like an altercation, a fight, but the way that it's done, so as a foster parent, I was trying to help her understand like, you know, consequences and then taking responsibility, like what you could have done different, blah, blah, blah. And it's immediate, right? It's like as a foster, as a parent, you're having this conversation, but then you have this overlay of the criminal justice system where suddenly like she has to have a defense attorney represent her in family court, in juvenile uh, justice court. Um, because, and so there's this now an antagonistic thing where they, she pleads not guilty, right? Now the burden's on the state to prove what she did and all of these other elements. Um, so we're stuck in this, in this loop for the, the next six months of, uh, and there's no, there's no learning, there's no kind of education around behavior. Uh, it's just this weird kind of antagonistic, it's the least educational approach to, um, to behavior, um, I, which I found to be absurd, you know, like as a foster parent looking in on the system going, well, she's pleading not guilty. And I'm explaining to the judge in the school, like, why did you call the, why did you call the police? Like, it, did you need, to, was that the best option from an educational perspective? Yeah. Okay. Does anybody else want to add anything to this topic or? Is anybody find a natural segue into um, 
Let's see. Well, let's. So we've spoken about when factors bring LGBT people. Also, can before we get there, can we actually speak about um, how LGBT people might feel around calling the police or the feeling that they may be discriminated against in filing a complaint? Because um, that's another thing, right? Because I remember doing the, um, during the same-sex marriage issue when the sh head of SHOPO, the head of the police Ooh. union, basically was so, um, so really uh, rude, homophobic, and just, I, it made me feel like this is not a resource that would be comfortable um, for, for, you know, as a queer person to call the police. And Again, I mean, but we've all had to deal with this with the Black Lives Matters kind of lens and analysis is now I'm thinking, well, is it ever safe to call the police for, for almost anybody unless you're a very specific kind of prototype? But is, uh, is, that, is this something that we want to touch upon before we talk about the actual experience of incarceration? Uh, I would love to talk about that. <laughs> um, I think that, you know, Stacia, uh, thank you for sharing your personal story about the encounter, right? That we know um, in order to build a Hawaii where everyone can seek healing and justice, um, it would mean uh, divesting uh, from police and reinvesting in diversion programs and more social workers and conflict mitigators and outreach workers who are better qualified and trained to help people in crisis. Um, you know, the current work being done by so, so many Black and Brown activists, including, you know, the Movement for Black Lives and past work done by activists going back centuries is, I think, so central to this conversation around uh, criminal reform um, and uh, where we really need to have this conversation where queer and trans and non-binary people, any harm that's done against us is, is just gone. Um, you know, it's in this work that we honor the lives of not only George McFloyd and Breonna Taylor, but also also Tony McDade, a black trans man killed by Florida cops, and the numerous, numerous women of color who lives are brutally taken, like Brooklyn Vishana, Brayla Stone, Mercy Mack. Um, and, and talking about, you know, the, uh, our relationship to the police, I think recently uh, Dr. Angela Davis said very clearly that you know, we support the trans community precisely because the community has taught us how to challenge that which is totally accepted as normal. If it is impossible to challenge the gender binary, then we can certainly effectively resist prisons and beliefs. Um, so those are the things that come to mind when, uh, you know, we have to talk about the history of policing, where does policing come from, and how do we reckon today that uh, they're not, they don't serve everyone. Uh, those are just the things that come to mind. Um, and, you know, this is, police encounters are usually people's, you know, this, that's how people end up in incarceration. They must first be arrested. Uh, so yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Shana. So what, what, are, the, uh, what are the issues um, facing LGBT people while incarcerated? Um, what are the services available? What kind of, um, What's, what's it like? And uh, Seisha, I don't know if you, you're comfortable addressing this from um, your perspective. Yeah, well, um, like there's no specific services for LGB, A, B, C, D, L, M, and O, P people. There's no specific services for it, for um, people, you know? And it's just kind of like you're just pushed in a, in a, in a, in a block or you're, you're pushed in a group of people. And, and if you are male to female transgender, you are put in an all-male facility. So you, you get all-male services. Um, so as far as services go, I, I, there's no services um, particularly for people. And if you are transgender, it's even smaller. And um, like, it's just recently that it's like no big deal for them to, to supply you with um, hormone replacement therapy. And, but before it was a hassle and um, you had to fight for it. And if you, and they judged you according to how you look. So 
if you look like a girl, then, oh yeah, you must have been on hormones, so you can continue to have hormones. But God forbid you have mustache and beard, because they would, they'll laugh at you and they'll tease you. Why, why do you want that? You, you, don't, you don't need that. You don't, you don't take that. And so even simple medical things that will help a transgender person get through life is not, it's not something that's automatically given to you. And so um, as fish as I am, of course, I had <laughs> hormones. They had no problem giving me hormones. But I would feel bad because, you know, like, my friends, my sisters would have, some of them would have a difficult time getting them back in the day. You know, now it's a, it, get, it got a little bit easier as time went by. But um, so even simple medical services sometimes is a hassle. And like, I think the, 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 the issues that, um, I can speak on transgender, I don't, that transgender people face in, in while being incarcerated is not, from the other inmates it, it's from the people that work there it's from the acos it's from the other civilians that work there like um i remember one one of my times when i was I, this is just in jail in in o triple c but i was trying to get a job in in o triple c and i applied to work on one of the work lines and um when i got there um the civilian that was in charge of that she told me oh no 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 get back to your mojo you ain't gonna work over here people like you cause so much trouble on my work line and so you know it's all the all the issues that that i ever faced while being incarcerated was from the civilian workers or from the acos or from like even the medical staff one time um I went to go get dental assistant and assistance, and I asked if I could um, have my teeth flossed or um, or if I could have dental floss. And she told me, "Oh, oh, only now you care about taking care of your teeth." You know, so it, I mean, everything is all all the discrimination and all the negative things that I encountered while being incarcerated was from staff members and so you know so there's no services no simple things that are offered to you and what was the other thing because i have so much to say what was the other thing you said Kim? Uh, just basically um you know what what kind of um just generally what are some of the problems faced what oh, kind yeah, of okay, impact okay, okay. it has okay so um, while, okay, so eyebrow pencil and all that is offered to genetically born females in prison, right? But it's not offered on the, you're in an all-male facility. So what I used to do is I used to get the number two pencil and I used to scratch it until it would have all these little shavings and I would dip it in water and I would draw in my eyebrows, Right. And so I had beautiful drawn in eyebrows and I was going to school and, um, you know, no, and then nobody bothered me all the way. I was, I passed through how many guards, nobody said anything, but the guard that was sitting at the bottom of the stairs that led you up to the school, he had a fit because my eyebrows were so beautiful that he couldn't take it. And so he sent me back to the module and they charged me with a crime. They charged me with a crime, and I said, oh, my God, what crime is this? And they said, um, Im not impersonating, but um, wearing a mask or a something to, to change what you look like. And so it was a risk that I would run away because I changed my face into a mask, and my eyebrows were drawn, you know? And so it, it, it's things like that that... that um, that we that we face, you know, and like I think like for the the for the gay boys that go into um, prison, they they face a lot of um, ridicule by the um, inmates too, and then they get teased a lot, you know, and everything is all hush hush, and so they may have sex with the inmates, but it's all under 
undercover and it's all, you know, and they, they face all the, the jokes are all on them. So as far as the, the gay boys that go to prison, they get teased a lot. And um, so being the, the advocate, the mother that I was in there, you know, I would tell them, oh, you know what? I'm confused to the guys who would tease them because did, weren't you just calling me in the shower to take a shower with you? Um, so I'm a little bit confused as why is why are you calling him a fag? And so, you know, as like the transgender people, like I said, they a lot of it is judged on your appearance. So the prettier that you are, the more female appearing that you are, the less drama you 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 get. You have absolutely no drama with the inmates. You can change there there can be a football game going on and all these 40, 50 something men are all into the football game and you say, oh wait, I'm changing the channel. And you can change the channel and all they'll say is, oh, oh, you know? And so you kind of, as a transgender person, you kind of have power in the prison system. Like I said, the prettier you are, the more power you have. The bigger your breasts, the more womanly you look, the more power you get with the inmates. But as far as almost every single other person that worked in the prison system, that's where all the discrimination comes from. That's where all the, the bad action comes from. I mean, you know, I could, like I said, I can go on and on and all the things that happened to me, but that's like kind of like the, the um, main thing. Oh, one time, one time, one of the um, guards, um, told me, um, well, he didn't tell me, he didn't know I was there. So he was talking to my boyfriend at the time and telling, asking him, oh, when you have sex, what? Her, her ass bleed, her ass bleed, because that, that's, that's what she do, yeah? That's what she do, her ass bleed. And so, and I was right there. And so I said, what you said? And so... Anyway, I, I, I knew how to do it. I knew how to turn them in. And, but most people don't have self-esteem. Most people don't have the courage to, to turn people in, you know. And so, uh, but I turned him in. And so, what, thank God that somebody in the upper administration in this, this one particular prison that I was in was an advocate for me. She's all, from the day I stepped foot into her prison, she was an advocate for me. And I'm her friend 20-something years later. And so... She made it where he couldn't be like, it was like a TRO. He couldn't be around me. So wherever he was working, um, he had to go somewhere else when I was coming. So like when he was working in the library one time, I, I went and I saw him and I said, the queen has arrived, has arrived. You need to go. You're, you're more than 100 feet by me. I said, I don't want to smell you. I don't want to see you. You need to go. Call your sergeant. Tell your sergeant that you need to go. You know, so... All those, I mean, like I said, I could go on and on and on and on, but it's all from staff members. It's, I, I never was discriminated or treated meanly by the other. Um, wow. You know. Well, so, and that, you mentioned that was like 20 years ago. Um, mm -hmm. Mandy, Mandy are, are there any updates since then that you've been hearing about or cat from that's going on in the prison system today? What is, what is it like today? What are some of the problems uh, faced by LGBT IQ folk while on the inside, and the imp and what are some of the impacts it's having today? Well, unfortunately, uh, Stacia's experience with harassment from staff is not unique. So we know that, and we know that um, LGBTQ folks face higher rates of sexual abuse, reported sexual abuse while incarcerated. Um, LGB people are about three times as likely as the general prison population to report sexual abuse. And um, transgender people are nearly 10 times more likely to be sexually assaulted while incarcerated. Um, other conditions problems um, are LGBT people are more likely to put into solitary confinement, which is tantamount to torture. And particularly trans women, um, this is used against trans women in uh, carceral settings, purportedly for their own protection, but we're just, we're torturing somebody uh, to protect to them. Protect it, them. Yeah, to, it makes no sense and it further traumatizes folks. Um, 
There's also things like medical copays. We have a $3 medical copay in our correctional facilities. You need to go to the doctor. You should have, you have the right to go get medical care. There should not be yes. um, a financial barrier. It's absolutely unjust. Um, so harassment um, barriers, financial barriers, um, uh, sexual assault, um, conditions and treatments in correctional facilities just tend to be a lot more a lot worse for LGBTQ folks, unfortunately. I just wanted to say that prisons are based, the norm is based on medium violent men. They don't know what to do with anybody who doesn't fit that profile. So right there, you can see that you can have, you know, tweak it here and tweak it there, but the problem is so deeply embedded in that system, in all our systems actually, um, that we really need to lift that up and constantly be saying, you know, when the state incarcerates somebody, they take responsibility for that person. So when the state incarcerates somebody, and that person can no longer take care of their own health needs, that is the state's responsibility. And the state has an obligation to do that. And they have not met that obligation if people have to do the $3 copay, if they have to explain in 29 different ways why they need to see somebody in the medical unit. I mean, you would think that you could just write a, a form, give it to your counselor, you would get a call to go to medical. In the free world, maybe. In prison, no. It doesn't happen like that. Nothing is easy. It's really, everything is a huge drama. Mm. <laughs> and Stacia's right, because a lot of the assaults on LGBT people are from staff and guards. And I've actually heard guards talking. So it is frightening and um, it should be a clarion call to the legislature. Wait a minute, what are we doing? We're causing harm. We're, we're making people sick. And when we send people to solitary, after release, the numbers say people who've spent time in solitary and come out, they, a lot of them commit suicide. It is, I mean, it's really scary. And we've had a lot of deaths in the prisons in the last two years. Mm -hmm. And most of them were preventable. And it's because they're just not paying attention. And, you know, we need as a community to stand up and say, what are we doing? But then when you look at the comments in the paper, it's frightening. You think, oh my God, where did I wake up? <laughs> is yeah. this Hawaii? Yeah. So regarding healthcare, um, somebody on Facebook, because it is streaming live, um, Ashley asks, how is access to HIV medication in the Hawaii prison system? Is it straightforward, like for example, a seizure or diabetic medication, or are there additional barriers in addition to the $3 copay? Are there other barriers? Uh, can you, I mean, if a Kat or Stacia or Mandy or Shana, you can get well, it. I, I responded in the chat, but um, so HIV meds are given, you know, like any other medication during the medication call, like they'll, they'll announce at whatever time it is, they'll say uh, medications line up and then everybody lines up and you just tra la la your way to wherever they're giving the medications at. And so that's not really the problem. The problem is, again, the civilian worker, the nurse or whatever she is or he is, will tell the other inmates. Oh, you know what kind of medications she's taking, yeah? For yes. AIDS. For AIDS. Yep. He's taking them for AIDS. He's taking them for AIDS. She's taking them for AIDS. You know, so while they are providing you with the um, medication, they're, they're letting everybody know. You're, they're you're broadcasting. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And all you have to do is tell one person and the other person is going to tell the other person. And yep. Next thing you know. So, so medications so are I provided. Mm. So what happened with the lawsuit that um, was at the center of the HYCF, that it was an ACLU lawsuit specifically around LGBT harassment. Um, I, again, it was like 20 years ago, but, and there was some kind of um, 
a decree or some kind of agreement that we're now out of. But mm -hmm. um, what happened? Uh, did it actually affect anything? Did it affect the um, the the adult prison, or was it just specifically the youth prison? Kat, do you know, or Mandy, are you yes. familiar with that? Yeah, yeah. Um, it only affected the youth prison, and at the time that the lawsuit was waged, the the youth prison was built with for thirty two beds. That was it. And the, the plan was build a small facility for kids that need, you know, a lot of treatment. And you build a whole network of community programs. But in its wisdom, the legislature only built the prison for the kids. And by the time um, the lawsuit happened, there were like between 90 and 100 kids there. <laughs> so, you know, they were triple bunked. It's, oh, it is a horrible place big metal doors with little windows and you know they say oh stop calling it a prison and I said I was there <laughs> it's a big metal door beds that are bolted to the floor that's a prison and that kid can't walk out that's a prison so um, so after that um, ACLU the ACLU asked the governor to go in and do a um, an analysis she refused, Governor Lingle, and ACLU went in and the population dramatically <laughs> reduced. And 20 years later, there's like 20 kids there. So it's, it's and they set up a, another uh, place on the, uh, a house that's run by RISE on the property for kids between um, 18 and 24 who you know could be homeless or just are, are struggling um yeah. they don't have to thank be justice involved yeah thank you for sharing that shift cat in how we were and what the population was um 20 years ago and then the impact an organization like the aclu and community members such as yourself cat um affected the kind of change it affected um years later um so we are scheduled to go for another half an hour actually um, and we were just going to start um, going into, we spoke about what are the factors that um, lead LGBT members of our community into, um, into incarceration and the criminal justice system. We spoke about life on the inside, access or the, the difficulties in accessing health care. Um, and now I think we're going to move into, so what do we do about all of the problems that we addressed? We actually just spoke about the ACLU and the loss that they instituted um, or they pursued around 20 years ago. And there was a decree and it affected just um, the, the youth prison system, um, which then has, um, the population has decreased in the youth prison system by a lot. And so that was the impact of the ACLU and Community Alliance on Prisons and a whole bunch of advocates and um, activists had on, on this um, prison um, policy or incarceration or justice policy. But what more can we do and what kind of changes can we look forward to um, pursuing um, by through our networks and our community activism? Um, do you, um, does anybody want to start or should we go to Mandy? Shana, you unmuted. Do you want to start? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, I think that uh, uh, moving forward, I think, well, I mean, everyone kind of really uh, painted this broad picture of that fundamentally we're in trans folks are fighting to survive and endure a system that like does not love us, right? Like, as we pointed out in our lived experiences just now, uh, so many laws, um, and policies were set in place to criminalize our very existence. Uh, being queer and being queer and trans challenges the status quo on how, on how so much Western identity, sexual orientation, masculinity, femininity, um, and family ideals are built on. Um, so, and, and I, I know from like just coming out or I like to now phrase it as uh, inviting people in to honor your authentic self is a personal and political choice with a lot of consequences. Um, and what I think is so unique to our community is how we've adapted to create chosen, chosen families 
often when our families or society has abandoned us um, when we choose or are forced to live authentically. And we see the success and heart and love uh, that, that happens when we pull our resources together to support each other. Um, this space is one of them. Um, but we also saw it historically when lesbians supported our gay and trans siblings dying of AIDS, when black trans women rioted against police brutality in Stonewall, and many of us continue to rally around marriage, anti-bullying, suicide awareness. But I think in this moment, um, we're, we're saying we need to check in and see who in our family is being left out. Uh, we need to talk about who is being arrested, and namely our Native Hawaiian Pacifica queer and Mahu siblings. Uh, we need to talk about the stigma and myths surrounding our family, uh, surrounding incarceration and arrest. Um, and we also need to look into our queer spaces and businesses and organizations that we all support uh, and redesign them to include all of us. Uh, when one of our siblings returns back to us from incarceration, from, being, from surviving a cage, we need to welcome them home and support them. So when I think of like actions, one is like the fundamental level of like what sort of conversations are you having at home with your friends on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, um, and then also at the workplace, at your church. Uh, and then for like concrete policies, you know, uh, expunging our uh, expungement is a big one. Uh, fully funding and supporting reentry programs and housing programs um, that we need to focus and prioritize our attention on cheaper, safer programs that like actively keep us safer than um, investing more into policing and a new jail in Halaba. Um, I, and I know Monet, Mandy can like probably expand more on some of the uh, legislative priorities that we can all move forward and do. Um, but one that really comes to mind to me is like, we've been talking a lot about elections this year and the prosecutor's race is such an important one if you really, uh, Want, want to talk about um, who has a lot of power in mass incarceration in Hawaii um, and you know who has the discretion and like the power to to incarcerate our um, LGBTQ loved ones so um, yeah that's a bit of my ramble I will just piggyback off of um uh, what Shane was saying about some of the concrete policy solutions that we can, you know, that we can help advance and that as, um, you know, different parts of the LGBTQ communities, we need to get behind. Like if we, non-discrimination ordinances, marriage equality, all of those things are good and necessary, but as a community, as a whole, we need to be, uh, we need to be supporting, especially um, like, black and brown queer and trans folks like in the advancement of an, a complete overhaul of our criminal justice system and our policing systems. We need to reimagine the role of police. As, uh, as queer people, we know and understand very deeply how corrosive and damaging shame can be. And prisons just recreate these conditions of shame and violence and isolation that may have been the driver behind behavior that is criminalized, such as substance use. Um, LGBTQ folks have higher rates of substance use and um, substance use disorders. We're not going to find healing and liberation through systems that uh, see the solution to that is just throwing people into cages. So one concrete policy that we can put forward next session that um, failed this session, unfortunately, is that we need to defelonize small amount, the possession of small amounts of drugs that are classified as dangerous. So just residue, we're just having residue on you right now um, is a class C felony. And so we're marking people as felons. And it's not even just after you reenter, there are so many, there's so many coll uh, collateral consequences to having a felony on your record when it comes to housing, when it comes to financial assistance for schools, uh, for school, when it comes to employment, of course. But also, while you're incarcerated, if you are incarcerated for a felony offense, your right to vote is taken away from you. You are excluded from the franchise. Um, we need to, and, and if, you're, if you're in there just for um, your personal struggles with addiction, uh, aside from just it not being an effective treatment for, for substance use, um, you're being denied constitutional rights for something that is a public health matter and needs to be treated as a health matter. So we need to defelonize possession of small amounts of drugs. 
Um, we need better reentry services, like Shana was saying. Um, we need to reinvest the savings. We could save millions of dollars if we passed bills like SB 2793, which defell it, which created um, a misdemeanor offense for the possession of small amounts of dangerous drugs. We could save millions of dollars and reinvest that into community-based treatments that we know um, from data are more effective at treating substance use. We need to greet people and, and treat people with compassion um, and not just incarceration. We also need to reimagine the role of police right now. Police are the default in Honolulu for just a myriad, a myriad of things like uh, mental health calls and, and houseless outreach. Um, we need to take that out of the police jurisdiction and move it into people who are more competent and able to address those as, as public health matters um, and, and, and make sure that we are, we are treating people and not just incarcerating them and moving them around. Kat, I'm sure you have uh, a lot to add as well. Well, the bulk of the people who are incarcerated are in for Class C felonies. And we spend $200 a day to incarcerate people who have a public health problem. So the bulk of our incarcerated population is people with mental health and substance misuse issues. Those are public health issues. Imagine if we actually looked at the justice system through a public health lens and we realized the harm that we're doing to people. I'm glad that Mandy mentioned the defelonization bill. That was very difficult <laughs> to um, try to convince the legislature who believe that using drugs is a choice. And some people don't have that choice. They have a you know, a penchant for that. They have a, it's in the, it's genetic for them. So to see the world as black and white is really, really dangerous because then everything is either good or it's bad. And we know that the world is really gray and we're all trying to make our way through it. So we need compassion. One of my problems with trying to get different policies is we need a structural change. So until we have that structural change, we can put little band-aids on stuff, but it's, we've got to convince people that what we're doing is causing more harm. Do your kids come home from school with books? No, because they can't afford books. Why? Because too many people are in prison for 200 bucks a day, so we don't have money for things that really matter. So we need to really frame a people's budget and push the legislature to actually take care of the people first. But right now it's all about the tourists. And one thing that's really uh, a thorn in my craw is during the whole COVID thing, since March, I've been after them. Please test people. We see what's going on around the country. It's going to leak out into the community. We are concerned. You have a responsibility to protect the health and safety of the people inside. Totally ignored by the legislature, by the police chief, by the mayor, by the governor, by everybody. And then we had the outbreak at OCCC. So what does the governor say now? He says, oh, you know what? We need that prison for, you know, we need to build a jail for economic development. So now they love prisoners because, hey, that's economic development. That is just so wrong. We are on the wrong course. <laughs> Frustrating. And we're hurting people. Seisha, do you have any thoughts about what more needs to be done. Uh, but before we get to you, Sisha, can I just, I want to go back to some, um, a piece that Mandy mentioned about felons cannot vote. And I think, I just want to clarify, you meant that, and you may have said this, but it was only while they're incarcerated. And in fact, when they're out on probation, when they're out in the general population, they do have the right, because that's one of the things when I've been door knocking, they're like, I can't vote. And I know what they mean when they say I can't vote. It's because they think there's code for saying I have a felony and I can't vote and I have to educate them and make sure they know that they can vote. 
Um, so other than re-registering people to vote as they're exiting prison, and I know that um, there was a, a work done around making sure people had ID and all the kind of cards and identification. No, that never happened. I thought, okay, well, so that's something that Kat, uh, can you talk more about that? Like what is not there? I mean, I would have imagined that they would have got some career proof for section eight as they came out. I thought, I mean, all no. of these things that seem to make sense so that you oh, don't we're recycle not doing people. That. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, we're not so. doing that. Um, basically, we have no reentry, and reentry is dependent on people having ID. Um, to get jobs, to cash checks, to, you know, to basically be in the world. And in 2008, the Department of Public Safety promised the legislature, we're going to bring that machine to every facility and we're going to make sure everybody who's going to get out has ID. And I was like, okay, I'm, I'm waiting. 2016, we had to write a bill because it never happened. And we're still waiting. <laughs> and they got an appropriation. And then they said, oh, we got an appropriation, but we bought the wrong machine. So what does this say? They have no desire to help people, to help people re-enter after release. We have no re-entry program. We have no, we have a re-entry office with about 10 people and a big budget. And yet during the whole COVID thing, they were releasing people who had nowhere to go. And what was the reentry office doing? Zero. So we're paying for this and we need to demand that they help people. That is their responsibility, their kuleana. Mm -hmm. Stacia, did you have anything else that you wanted to add? <laughs> I just wanted to add that I, um... I used to work at a re-entry program and there there was a re-entry program before on Maui and then it got shut down. But, um, and as hard as it was um, to get people to buy in, after we got them to buy in, everything was so easy. You know, like a lot of the barriers were just taken away. And barriers, I mean, like what Kat was talking about, about, um, ID and even driver's license and um, and housing and, um, and and work clothes and these were not just your your average easygoing class C felons. These were class A. We worked with class A and class B felons. We got some of the funding from the Serious and Violent Offender Act, so it was class A and class B felons, which was mostly sex offenders, and so the barriers for sex offenders was even higher. And, um, but it was so easy, it was so simple. If you saw our program running, you would think that that was the most simplest thing in the world. And so when we lost the funding that, I mean, I was like just floored because we had a third party evaluator that was evaluating the program and our, um, uh, our rates were like 30, less than 30% recidivism. And the, the, at the time, the, the recidivism, recidivism rate on the statewide goals was like 65, 70% recidivism. And our, the people that participated in our program were, was like less than 30%. And these people, like I said, were not your easy five-year felons. These were 10, 15, 20, 25 years in prison. And they were successfully transitioning into the community um, on Maui, mind you, where it's probably harder to access a lot of the services, you know, and it was so simple. I mean, we got the buy-in from the, the courts and they, they like, um, they had um, um, traffic tickets before, like was just stacked up. And there's no way that anybody could do all of that. And they were getting wiped out. The, the traffic tickets, the judge was saying, okay, well, you know what? Today's your lucky day. We're going to start you off with no tickets. And that was, that was like so easy, like I said. And um, they were getting driver's license. Where it was so simple. And we weren't even spending that much money 
on doing it, you know? And so I, I, I just don't know how, and you know, like, and speaking of like the driver's license, right? So when I got out of prison the last time, I was trying to get my driver's license because I knew I need some kind of identification. So I was trying. So I had this ally that was working at the prison I was in. And so they, they looked for me. And then, so they set me up a court date. And um, so I went to court and the, um, uh, I guess that was the prosecutor kept calling me he and Mr. and he and Mr. And so I told my public defender, you better tell that blah, blah, blah to stop calling me that. So my public defender told the judge, your honor, you know, um, you, you see her standing in front of you. You obviously see that's not a Mr. You obviously see, will you please have this? person that stopped addressing her as him and blah, 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 blah. So, but the prosecutor kept on acting like she made a mistake. Oh, oh I forgot. I mean, he, I, I mean, she, you know? And so the judge, I think, got so irritated with her. And he says, you know what, Miss O'Hira, today is your lucky day. Do you remember what you ate for lunch yesterday? I said, actually, no, I don't. And he says, me too. He said, I don't, I don't remember what I ate for breakfast this morning. So how can you remember what happened 12 years ago? You don't remember what happened 12 years ago. I'm going to dismiss case number, blah, 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 blah. Dismiss case number, blah, 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 blah. Dismiss case. You know, and it was simple as that. And I got a free start. I was able to get my driver's license. You know, no problem. And it's just very simple things that can happen. I mean, you know, the, I don't know how, how to do it. Kat Brady does, Shayna does, Mandy does. I don't know how to do it, but I know how to do it once all those things is cleared, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's simple, easy, cheap, cheap, cheap moves. You know, like people are going crazy over the defund police um, movement. And I'm telling them, wait a minute, that doesn't mean defund the police, literally defund the police. You need to look at it more to see what they're talking about, you know, and and just like we were talking about earlier, right? Public health so, issue. Mm -hmm. So we're coming to the last 15 minutes of our town hall, and we did want to open up to some questions. And I see, again, we are live on Facebook, and Ashley asks, are there halfway houses, um, are halfway houses or transitional houses um, are they helping? Um, are they helping people coming out get IDs? Are there actual services that these halfway houses offer, or are they just landlords? Yeah, they're they're they're, they're the halfway houses or the or the approved. Um, I mean, even at the halfway houses, transgender people are getting dis discriminated against with people who are in. The 12 step programs who own these houses, they are discriminating against them. My friend, she got out on parole. She was at the house. The halfway house told her that she needed to wear boys' clothes or she can't stay at the house. The halfway, I mean, you know, I want, and I knew the owner of the place needed to say I wanted to kill him. So I wasn't the one to, to talk to him, right, about it. But you know, and the people that are working there, they don't, that's a job for them. They, they, these are recovering addicts coming out of prison themselves. They need a job. They're not going to fight against the owner. You know, so the halfway houses that I know of, the clean and sober houses that I know of, are not doing it except for one, you know. Mm. And so, this, you know, this, about the discrimination that your friend was experiencing, I mean, the Hawaii Civil Rights Commission in no, I mean, they can't, act on these things so that this person, their own individual experience, but they can pursue a case against the landlord or even if the state is subcontracting, there, there are, they do have the authority to investigate. Um, but does the ACLU take cases like this? If you hear about this, like what kind of, I guess, direct representation cases would the ACLU be interested in addressing as well? Um, do we know? <laughs> We're gonna get in trouble with our legal. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean that would be yeah, that would be our legal department. Um, so I would definitely. But if if 
something like that arises for you or somebody you know, please refer them to the ACLU. We have a legal intake page that you can fill out with the um, details of your case and you will get, you will get a response from us um, whether or not we're going to move forward with your case in a representative capacity. Kat, did you have anything you wanted to add? I wanted to say that there is one place that has actually been a great, great help for people coming out of prison, and that's the Waikiki Health Center, the Putin Rule Nua program. They actually, in one year, gave or got IDs for like 980 people. The Department of Public Safety, oh, not so much. So wait, was the Waikiki Health Center, were they getting any kind of funding from the state to do that work? They actually got funding from HMSA <clears throat> to do it. And I, and I think they have a, I hope, they still have a small contract with public safety to do that. Although public safety has a multi-hundred thousand dollar office full of 10 people. I don't know why they can't do it. Mm -hmm. uh, are there questions, specific questions you want to give voice to? Because I'm not seeing any in the chat. I only saw Ashley's. I would like to say people need to get involved to stop the jail because the, the state's response to protecting tourism is, oh, houselessness. That's bad for tourism. Oh, people who are, you know, doing drugs or have mental problems, we need to move them out of the way of the tourists. So everything is about hiding, which is why they want to build the prison, the jail, actually, at the animal quarantine station back in Halava Valley, out of sight. So to me, you don't run away from public health challenges. You run toward them. You face them. You address them. But Hawaii is so notorious for kicking the can down the road. And now we're in this horrible position where we have an overcrowded facilities and very few services. Thank you for mentioning that. Where I know that it was a, um, a testimony was being received by the IA Neighborhood Board at some point where where are we now with opposing the construction of an or uh, you know putting money towards a new prison or jail well the where consultants do we are doing well <laughs> they're living large on our dollars um they're they're more interested in buildings than who's actually in there so to me it's like it's like you're trying to buy a house but you're, you have 12 kids and you're looking at a three bedroom. It's like, you know, you got to figure out what is the population, what are the needs, and then you build for that. But instead, um, they just want to build like a 1,300 bed for several buildings um, that equal like 1,300. And it's crazy. Why are we doing that when we know that most of the people in there are in there for public health issues that could be addressed in a cheaper, more effective way and less harmful. Thank you, Kat. It, it's a long way to go. Yes. <laughs> Short absolutely. answer, because they have a lot of things they have to do. Right. So with their specific bills that we're going to be working on uh, that I think uh, Mandy and Shana mentioned, we're going to be working on uh, with this with the upcoming legislative session, uh, maybe following up on work that you guys have already started. Maybe it's about, you know, you know, trying to get new bills introduced, obviously cost savings, anything that's going to cost, uh, save the state save or, or the county's money um, would be, a, you know, a great way to package it. Um, one of the things too is that I feel like as a community, the LGBTIQ community, we don't often think of the criminal justice system as being part of our issue, you know, and I just, uh, the more, I think the more, I think that's why I'm so excited about this town hall discussion was that it's really putting it at the forefront to say, hey, we're going to celebrate pride, but we have to celebrate the full breadth of our community 
and what we can achieve together. And um, it's not just, you know, about celebrating um, people who've grown up with a lot of, you know, uh, privilege and access, but also about saying, how do we pull everyone up so we all benefit um, in this new freedom and with uh, celebrate our liberation together across oppressions and across struggles. Um, and I'm so happy that you mentioned that Stonewall was a riot. It wasn't a peaceful protest. Right. <laughs> we sat in the middle of the street. We actually rioted. And, and that is the that is our origin story of liberation, right? The riot. And so when our community sees other communities um, taking a stand that we identify, we see that connection um, through our, our, ourselves. Um, and I think there's a couple more questions. We have six more minutes. Um, but as we, so I'm going to see what we can get to here. Um, let's see, somebody um, asked about the uh, sex, uh, registered sex offenders, how many are gay men? Um, is there any data around um, that part of the community? Mm, I've never seen it. I, I personally know a lot of sex offenders and I personally only know one. Gay guy? Gay guy that is a sex okay. offender. Okay. But, I mean, you know, that's not saying much, but I do know a lot of sex offenders. Okay. So that's just like basically not <laughs> real solid data, but it's yeah. Uh, yeah. anecdotal, anecdotal. Okay, but well, another you know, question. I'm glad you brought that up, Kim, because data is a real problem in Hawaii. Getting really accurate data. If you want to make really good, sound, thoughtful policy, you need to have good data to base it upon. But we, you know, they, they didn't even for a while want to con collect data on Native Hawaiians who were incarcerated. <laughs> and I'm like, well, you should because it's mostly Native Hawaiians in there. Yeah. And I think, was it OHA that actually invested some of those resources to get that data brought to the forefront? Um, and they had a hard time getting data. <laughs> right, right. Uh, so there's another question. How can we get the more privileged folks in order to join the fight? Actually, I think we just spoke about that. But how, how do we, um, let's see, I'm, I'm going to read the question that maybe, so queer um, um, by people of color have always been at the forefront of fighting the carceral state and moving toward abolition. That being said, within the LGBTQ community, a lot of the intersectional issues are still present, such as class, gender, racial divisions. How can we get the more privileged folks to join in the fight for criminal, uh, for criminal justice reform? Um, and maybe this could be part <laughs> of our last thoughts. You can incorporate yeah. if you want to answer this and also start winding down with a, a minute each for last thoughts. Our closing um, I think is this um, I'm like is this question within the framework of how do we organize privileged queer folks uh, queer and mm -hmm. trans folks uh, who may not uh, be so impacted by criminal justice issues I think it starts with hard conversations uh, about how our collective liberation is dependent on uh, all of us being free uh, right. when when one of us is caged all of us is caged um, so and how to and reimagining what a Hawaii looks like without cages is all of our responsibility. Uh, having that conversation with folks who aren't impacted, it is a hard one, right? Like, how do you relate to them on a way uh, that they need to have empathy? And how do we build more empathetic and kinder communities that account for everyone? I think that goes back to who we view ourselves as a community and as people. Um, you know, not all my friends benefited from the marriage, uh, from, from the issue of marriage equality. A lot of my friends were left out of the conversation. Uh, and I think how beautiful Hawaii could be if we started from there. Who, who, do, who is not at the table? Who's not in the room? Who do we leave out um, when these issues that we throw all our money and resources behind come up? Uh, because I think if we look to um, women like Stacia and uh, women who've led 
a lot of our, our major movements, uh, they, they really do give us a lot of the, the way forward. Um, so I guess that's, that's my thoughts. It's a lot of hard conversations. There's going to be tears, there's going to be mistakes along the way, but I think if we commit to this collective idea that uh, we're in it for each other, um, we can see it through. Yeah, so that's my thoughts. Thank you, Shana. Anybody else want to give some last, share some last thoughts? Um, oh, you can go, Mandy. Oh, please, Stacia, go. No, I just wanted to say that I always say this because to me it's like so important. Like even me as a, a in my professional uh, position that I'm in now, and I do all the trainings, I. I try to instill this in, in people without breaking my confidentiality and <clears throat> whatnot. But I think that there's still, there needs to be a lot of hope. Hope needs to be instilled in the people that are fighting for us. Hope needs to be instilled in the people that are supposedly helping us. Hope, you know, and so like people need to continue to hear stories. Like if you saw me walking on Ala Moana Boulevard or up New Juana Avenue doing my cardio, you, you would never dream, you would never know my story. You would never know I was an injection drug user. You would never know that I was incarcerated for many, many, many years in and out of prison. You would never know all of that. And, you know, and you would never know that my, my story now is I have a beautiful partner, a very loving partner. I have beautiful children. I live very comfortably. You would never know that if I didn't tell you that. So I think that people need to, to, to get their stories out there and, 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 and know, that, um, know that there's hope and know that people, I know this is a cliche, but you know, we do recover. People do recover. And um, because without the hope, then that's, that's where a lot of our judgmental people that live in our own community you know, the people that live in our own community are judgmental against transgender people. The people who live in our, are the most judgmental about class, religion, how you look like, sex, age. We were laughing the other day talking, you know, about ASL and um, no fats, no femmes, you know, all these stupid things. I mean, that, that, that kind of stuff needs to be abolished in our community. And, you know, we want everybody else to accept us and we want everybody else to love us when a bitch can't even love the people that's living in, in their own community, you know? And yeah. So that basically my thing and my, my, my last thoughts are always the same is hope. People need, we need to somehow instill hope in the people that are doing it for us. Cause I can't talk forever. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> but you can, Blanche, you can. <laughs> On that, Mandy, do you want to share? I'm not going to say anything more beautiful than that. What am, what am I going to say? No, um, I do think that speaking to the question that was put on the chat of uh, how we get privileged folks to join in the fight for criminal reform, um, I think that as white queer people, we need to know that our queerness is not does not immunize us from white privilege. We may face some types of oppression, but the oppression that we face is not because of our race and we need to acknowledge the past harms that have been done to uh, queer and trans people of color in our movement and how white, how we have so heavily centered um, the white gay perspective in our movement for liberation and have ignored the hard work and victories stone, you know, and, and how queer and trans women of color have been really at the forefront as the, as the question says. So an acknowledgement of past harms, decentering ourselves um, and moving forward with the intention of getting it right, not being right. And Kat. So I would close by saying love and unity we need to stop the infighting we need to identify what we're where we're going get together and go there um i really believe that love is the answer and i see that um i've been disappointed um, 
because I haven't seen a lot of love. And I think that's scary because without that, we're never going to actually move toward peace. So love your neighbor. Thank you. Thank you, Kat, Mandy, Shana, Stacia, and thank you to Randy and Andrew and the board of the Hawaii LGBT Legacy Foundation, again, for hosting this. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. And I think, Randy, do you have a few last words you want to talk about the next uh, town hall that's going to be coming up next week? Of course, thank you so much to all of our panelists and our moderator. You guys are all amazing and we are super excited uh, that we were able to start off our panel series with all of you guys. Um, please join us. We do have some upcoming panels coming uh, next week. Uh, they will start on Tuesday, Thursday. Um, the next one is an education panel and uh, talking about uh, LGBTQIA experiences within the education system. So please join us next week and we hope to see all of you there. Mahalo. Thank you, Kim. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thanks, Take everyone. Care. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Bye. Have a Love good evening. Guys. Bye.